as the commissioner mentioned, this is a conceptual model. We um, I actually had hoped we'd have this conversation a couple of years ago when I first looked at the rules and thought, wow, you know, it's time to update these types of rules. But um, got a little bit sidetracked with some of the other priorities, and unfortunately, it, it took us a while to kind of circle around and figure out what we wanted to do. We've taken a, a very much a, a fresh look at the legislative requirement and the rules we had in place. And we feel as though we can put together a conceptual model that's much better for consumers, much more applicable to, to the way people receive health care, the way they're interested in getting access to primary care, but also recognizes a lot of the changes in the delivery system to the extent that certain services are no longer available in the community. Instead, they're provided by centers of excellence that we may need to travel for. Those developments are going to continue uh, along the trends that we're seeing already. And we certainly want to develop a set of rules that's going to be, well, current for more than a year or two. So the general objectives of what we're trying to do, I would say that uh, among the bullet points on this slide, the two at the top are the main things that are most important. The first is we want to ensure access to services. The distinction here is access to services, not specific providers. We recognize that different providers are often providing the same service. Trends are changing such that we have mid-levels and nurse practitioners in the role of primary care, assisting specialists. We're receiving care in various settings. So to the extent we want to ensure access to service, that's the focus. At the same time, the big challenge with network adequacy requirements is avoiding giving a provider monopoly power. Any time we would dictate to an insurance carrier, they have to have a contract in a specific circumstance. That provides the provider organization with a fair amount of leverage. If the provider organization has a lot of leverage, they can demand the reimbursement levels they want and you know that's going to go up. We're going to see that in our premiums, we're going to see that in the costs, and we saw those debates take place during this last legislative session when bills were introduced to modify the network adequacy requirements. At the same time, we want to allow for alternatives to the traditional delivery of care. Even when you schedule an appointment at a hospital, that doesn't mean you're actually going to the hospital campus to receive that service. You may go down the road where it's a more efficient location, some place that's set up specifically for providing that type of care. We want to encourage competition among insurance companies and healthcare providers. In fact, a competitive insurance marketplace is one of the fundamental components of the insurance department's mission. It's something we strive for in many of the things we're trying to do. Allow for consumer choice of networks and insurance products. The thing we have to remember with any network adequacy requirement is we're setting a minimum standard that's going to apply to a very diverse set of purchasers. Some people are managing chronic conditions, need routine access to specialists and other prim and primary care providers. Other folks are buying insurance because they have to. They don't plan to use their benefits, they don't mind traveling if they do need health care, and they really want the cheapest insurance product. So what we have, and remember, we're developing rules. The insurance department develops rules because there's a statutory requirement. The rules are the details that go with the statutory requirement. The statutory requirement makes reference to access without unreasonable delay. Obviously, this could be a little bit subjective. There are some folks in different parts of the state that feel as though they have unreasonable delays in finding a good place to buy a nice toaster oven. So to the extent we're developing a network adequacy standard, we're not a centralized planning agency that's allocating health care re resources across the state. Instead, we're recognizing differences among communities and trying to apply a standard that is, is in place for the whole state, a minimum set of network adequacy requirements. And that's the other point. It is a minimum standard. Insurance companies are trying, at least they're supposed to be trying, to develop products that people want to buy at a price point that's sellable. So it's up to them to come up with a type of network and other benefits that appeals to people at a particular price point. And in most cases, insurance companies will have networks <coughs> that exceed the minimum standard in the network adequacy requirements. Particularly in New Hampshire, for years, almost all of the healthcare providers were in all of the health carriers' networks. We really didn't have much difference until 2014. We also recognize that there are vari variability in terms of the local availability of health care services. Our communities are different sized, the community needs are a little different, and even the way the systems have developed in different parts of the state vary widely. 
A lot of our hospital reps like to, see, like to say, if you've seen one hospital, you've seen one hospital. Well, likewise, all of our communities are different a little bit. We also recognize there are federal requirements for products on New Hampshire's insurance marketplace. We've got some standards now. Those federal requirements may develop further in the future. We want to make sure that they work in synchronicity with what we're doing at the state level when it comes to network adequacy requirements. To say a little bit more about that, the feds want to see reasonable access to health care services as well. But probably the most uh, important thing for New Hampshire to keep in mind is the requirement here. At least one essential community provider in each ECP category, and you can read the rest of it, but the essential community providers are largely community health centers or other provider organizations that are integral in providing health care to people who often haven't had insurance in the past. Likewise, to the extent we're developing network adequacy requirements, we're thinking about those same people who are buying private insurance and have never had it in the past. Therefore, what we think we're going to do with our network adequacy requirement is apply the same federal requirement for the exchange products to those small group and individual products off the exchange as well. That way, if there are products in the small group or the individual market, the network adequacy requirements are going to be the same whether or not it's all on the exchange. The backbone of what we're trying to do with the revisions to the network adequacy rules is have a strong emphasis on the community. So think about your cities and towns. When you go into town to get goods and services, you tend to think how long it takes you to get downtown. So this is true for healthcare, but it's also true for other healthcare service, other services. So to the extent you need to travel to town to find a good restaurant, a decent grocery store, a hardware store, there are certain travel expectations that go along with that that are also going to apply for healthcare. I think unfortunately we've tried to develop models that sort of a one size fit all. So it doesn't matter what part of the state is, the requirement is essentially the same. But what that means is that you could end up traveling to Nashua, for Con to Concord, for primary care, which is completely counterintuitive. Whereas 45 minutes for a, a network adequacy requirement when you live in the North Country, well, you know, that's, that's geez, I mean, you're actually even going to be able to do that within 45 minutes. So what we're doing is we're focused on, uh, focusing on network adequacy requirements that are community specific. The nice thing is New Hampshire is small enough, we can do that, or at least we certainly think we can. That doesn't mean we'll have a different requirement for Nashua, Concord, and Manchester. It may actually all be the same because perhaps those regions of the state are very similar. But to the extent we look at other extreme circumstances, we want to make sure the network adequacy requirement reflects the community needs and the community situations. So essentially, we're going to identify services that should be accessible locally and those that should be accessible regionally. We also realize one of the major developments in healthcare is the use of telemedicine. Telemedicine means different things to different people. And because of that, the New Hampshire legislature stepped up and came up with a definition of what we consider telemedicine to be in New Hampshire. And that's what you have here at the top part of the slide, the actual statutory definition of telemedicine. We feel as though the access to services requirement could be satisfied through telemedicine when appropriate. So we're hoping that this will give people in rural parts of the state renewed access to health care services they wouldn't otherwise get. It may even actually begin to define the role or a new role for certain organizations in parts of the state. To the extent medicine develops along these lines, the insurance department and our network adequacy rules should not be a barrier to the trends and progress that are desired by the health care community and by patients as consumers. That being said, the insurance department is not going into the area where we're going to decide about anything about standards of care. That's obviously something that should be decided by the healthcare community. And nothing that could be provided through telemedicine without meeting acceptable standards of care is going to satisfy network adequacy requirements. All right, the, uh, the big challenge with network adequacy, contracting and provider capacity. So what I mean by contracting, I'm talking about that network development that takes place between an insurance carrier and a health care provider. Insurance carrier seeks out the health care providers they want in the network. They go through a contracting and negotiation process to determine the reimbursement rates if that provider is going to participate in the network. 
Network adequacy can shift the leverage in those negotiations. To the extent that we want to encourage a competitive environment, we don't want to go too far with our network adequacy requirement. So for core services, those that you should be able to get on a local basis without traveling very far, particularly if you live within a community, carriers must include, must include at least 30% of the providers when at least three independent providers exist. If all of the providers have gotten together under a single employment umbrella, often to improve their negotiating leverage with an insurance carrier, then this network adequacy requirement is going to be weakened. We're also dealing with appointment times. One of the, my feeling one of the best sort of measures of access to a healthcare provider. Doesn't matter if somebody's in your town if you have to wait six to nine months for an appointment. I think this is going to be one of the more challenging areas to pin down. The National Committee of, of Quality Assurance, URAC, it's the agency that, uh, that um, accredits health plans. They often have standards that say you have to meet network adequacy requirements in the states, but they've also developed some standards for reasonable access for appointment times. Our current set of rules makes reference to NCQA. Uh, the thing is, if you actually try to track down the NCQA requirements, you may, may end up having to pay a fee to get them or find somebody who already has paid a fee to find out what they actually are. We'd like to include whatever standard we're going to apply actually in the rules. The other thing I'd like to do, um, although I know it's going to be challenging, is one of the industry practices is to look at the third next available appointment and use that as a measure for how quickly you can get into the office. The reason you use the third next available is really just because there are often cancellations. So if you call up a dermatologist and say, hey, um, I'd like to make an appointment, and I say, well, well, you know, we could fit you in tomorrow. Geez, that's great. That's awesome. That's not the best measure of access if the next appointment down the road is six months. So by using the third available appointment, it tends to establish a measure that's a little more robust. The problem may be there's not a lot of benchmark information out there. And clearly, the, next, the third next available appointment is going to be more relevant for certain specialty areas than others. Nevertheless, um, these are some of the standards we'd like to incorporate into the rules. And, um, and if you have any suggestions in this area, um, please provide that kind of feedback to the department. We'd really be looking for your contribution, particularly in this area. That being said, we have to allow for exceptions. One of the areas that actually has um, played itself out on occasion already with the network adequacy rules is whether or not a market competitive rate has been offered by the insurance company to the health care provider. This has taken place in circumstances where there's been a contract dispute and a carrier is no longer going to meet the current network adequacy requirements and the insurance department has played a role in determining whether or not a competitive rate has been offered. We have access to claims data. There are several of us who have actually experience in contracting. So we do have that, that as a resource and we could make determinations about whether or not a market competitive rate has been offered to the provider. We found in those circumstances both the parties don't really like to have the insurance department involved so there is certainly the incentive to resolve those types of disputes on their own. But nevertheless it is something that could be done um, on a case by case basis. The other is just when there's insufficient provider capacity exists. Obviously, an insurance company could have a contract with all of the providers that are offering a particular service in a community, and it doesn't matter. A patient's still going to have to wait six months to get in the door. We obviously don't have the ability to put more health care providers in those communities, and that's something that we're going to have to deal with um, on an exception basis as well, and the rules should address that. You probably can't see this very well, but hopefully you picked one up on the way in. One of the considerations when we were thinking about what types of healthcare services should be available at a local level versus those that you may need to travel further for is simply the availability of healthcare providers. If you've got a lot of healthcare providers offering the service, well, it's more likely you're going to be able to get that kind of service at a local level. So toward the top, we've got a lot of primary care categories. Down toward the bottom, we've got some very specialized ser services such as vascular surgery. The insurance department's not going to put forth a network adequacy requirement that requires you to have access to vascular, vascular surgery in every community in the state. Not only would that be impossible, if there are a lot of vascular surgeons, they probably wouldn't be seeing that many patients, and the quality of care wouldn't be very good either. One of the interesting things about healthcare 
is that often the providers that are performing the, most ser the services the most often for patients, particularly complex care, often do it with, higher, with better outcomes and at lower costs. So just to hit on this conceptual model a little bit further, this is the way we've seen the range of services and what kind of access you should have to them. So if we're looking down toward the bottom, that big blue circle, those are your core services. Those are the services that if you live in Nashua, you shouldn't need to travel to Concord for. You probably shouldn't even need to travel to Manchester for them. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got highly specialized services. Think transplants, specialized burn treatment, specialized pediatric trauma type care. Those are services that you are most likely to have to travel out of state for. The other services are somewhere between that and uh, we're certainly not going to put a requirement that says you have to have them in your local community, but perhaps traveling to the next town is perfectly appropriate. Again, remember these are network adequacy minimums. A carrier is certainly welcome and encouraged to have a full range of contracts with every healthcare provider in a community. So the actual list probably won't surprise you much on this one. These are your core services. Access to primary care, access to pediatrics, obstetrics. What may surprise you a little bit is access to mental health care and substance abuse treatment. And this goes back to thinking, okay, we've got a lot of new people on these insurance products, people who haven't had insurance before, people who may have other issues, and we feel um, for those reasons and many others, it's appropriate for those people to have access to these types of, this type of care at a local level. Laboratory services as well, at least for the drawing. You shouldn't have to travel 50 miles to have a lab test done. The next level up, we've got common services, sort of a moderate proximity. So the next layer, diagnostic radiology, radiation treatment, rehabilitation. You can read the rest of the categories. The two I want to point out, or the comments I want to make, first, when we, to the extent we think about rehabilitation or virtually any of the other categories, we're not so specific, or we're not planning to be so specific as to say it has to be provided by a physician. We want to allow for the fact that certain types of treatment are being provided by different health care providers, and there are going to be different ways for carriers to compete with one another in satisfying a network adequacy requirement. The other thing I want to mention is the general surgery. In order for a carrier to meet network adequacy requirement when it comes to general surgery, They've got to have contracts in place with the other health care providers that are involved in the surgery. It makes no sense to have a requirement that just applies to the general surgeon when the anesthesiologist, there's no contract in place and you're, seeing, you're getting treatment from a non-participating non health care provider in that respect. So again, the framework has changed. We're thinking about access to health care services, not health care providers so much, at least not specifically. Finally, within the New Hampshire or near the state border, we'll have to work out the details on a lot of this stuff, including what actually constitutes near the state border. Nevertheless, this is the kind of stuff it's perfectly appropriate to get in the car and have to travel for. We're talking about heart surgery and some of these other specialized surgeries that are available in the state, and we've got great centers performing them, but they're certainly not available everywhere in the state. Finally, we struggled with this one a little bit. Whether or not it should say New England, or something on the national basis, or I don't know, something in between. The challenge is these are really what we're talking about when we say centers of excellence in places that um, you really don't want to have done in, in, in well, uh, a very local level. So we're talking transplant services, and some of the specialized complex pediatric care, specialized surgery and burn centers. Carriers will have contracts often with places on a national basis that do uh, that have fantastic outcomes, the price is great, but we felt as though there were enough of them in New England, we'd at least have the requirement in place that the patient should have the choice to have these types of services performed within New England, so they don't have to travel too far. But like I said before, we'd appreciate some feedback in this area. I also want to point out that uh, just because a carrier has to have a network that includes these services in New England. That doesn't mean they can't have a contract with MD Anderson in, in Texas or, or someplace in Baltimore and an incentive for the member to go there. But we want to at least have a choice for the patient to stay within the New England region.
All right, this is a little bit of a work in process. Like I said, we don't have all the details ironed out yet. But um, the big decisions are going to have to be what happens when network adequacy requirements are not met. I've already suggested to you that it depends on the specific requirement that is unmet. We've got to have exceptions for appointment times when the provider capacity is at its maximum. Certainly the availability of healthcare providers is going to be one of those things that's going to be an ongoing challenge. We don't have the best allocation of healthcare resources in the state at the moment, and it's unlikely we will within the next 10 years. Nevertheless, we want to come up with a clear set of rules that deals with these types of cases and what actually happens. In today's world, if a carrier fails in network adequacy, they're not allowed to market in that particular part of the state. That seems like fairly a soft kind of impact, but uh, the reality is if the, if the carrier is offering products on the exchange, you put in your zip code, it's not going to show up if the carrier doesn't, hasn't met network adequacy in that part of the state. Perhaps we just need additional disclosure requirements, clear communication to the members, and indeed the insurance department has invo been involved in the communication that goes to members when there is a contract dispute or other network adequacy issues. Maybe we can do more on that front. And what, ha what should we do when there's been a competitive contract proposed? So the carrier's gone forward, they've offered rates that they're paying uh, healthcare providers across the, straight, the state, but in a particular community, the provider's saying no for whatever reason, what should we do in those cases? And then finally, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people access to healthcare services without escalating costs. So what alternatives exist to ensure access to care? What if a particular carrier fails to meet network adequacy in a particular community, but they're willing to set up a shuttle bus that runs back and forth from that community to one that's 20 or 30 miles away? I don't know, I mean, that's probably not likely to be the case, but what if they wanted to do that? Would that ensure access enough that we'd be able to allow a waiver of the network adequacy requirement? The point is we want to think creatively about how to solve the solutions for access to care while controlling health care costs. So in summary, we've divided up the CATVA services, and then we're still going to do more work in this area. Between those that are core services, again, those that if you live in Nashua, you should be able to get in Nashua. You don't have to go to Manchester for it. And those on the other end of the spectrum, where we want to know what the patient expectations are for specialized services, even though we know the patient's going to have to travel out of state. Clearly, the community structure is going to play a role in how we develop these requirements. Obviously, if a community is small enough, they're not going to have a competitive situation with providers, so that's going to solve some of it. If you've only got one provider in town, we're not going to put a network, requi network adequacy requirement that's going to force the carrier to contract with that provider. That's the easiest way to see an escalation in payment rates and in turn our premiums. Oops, wrong button. So first, we are going to open it up to questions, but I have questions for you. Um, these are the important questions we thought of as we went through the presentation in preparation for today. And the first is, is the basic concept clear? And I know you're going to have questions about the details. We still do, even though we've got some ideas about how to solve them or write them out. But maybe the, uh, the other larger question is, will the requirement meet the intentions of the legislature? Intentions when the original statute was passed, the intentions whenever we have a debate about changing network adequacy in the legislature. We want to protect consumers. We want to encourage competition among insurance companies and healthcare providers. And at the same time, we want to restrain costs. Those are some of the main objectives, the main goals that we have associated with developing network adequacy. Good news is I'm not here on my own. We have several other members from the department and we're really happy to, to take your questions and, um, and answer them the best way we can at this point in time. Hey, Erica. Hey, Sally. Hey. So, on the, this is it's really interesting. I appreciate this. It's a really clear presentation. Thank you. The immediate thought from the provider side that came into my mind when you talked about the structuring of the services as a way, you know, the switch from providers to services is your second bullet. I mean, to me, the immediate thought that came to my mind is it's going to encourage provider consolidation, I think. Because you're now talking about services and this idea like of a shuttle bus, say, going from Nashua to Concord for, heart, for cardiac care or something like that. And I didn't know if you guys had 
if you were thinking about that, and then my other question is, are you thinking, uh, you probably, I don't know if you are, but from the provider side again, um, just like, I don't know, it seems like to be able to remain competitive, and this is just my thought after listening to this, without provider consolidation, it would be difficult to be, be able to, to manage the contracting piece. I'm just, and again, I'm not, I'm just, throwing it out there. Right. That. No, no, I, I think there are, there are important points. I mean, we're, we're dealing with, with consolidation and cooperation at the same, I mean, these are happening regardless of what we do with network adequacy rules. Um, I think to the extent that there is collaboration, that's a, a favorable trend, particularly to the extent that the delivery of healthcare could take place more efficiently. But to the extent that we address kind of the, the, the incentives for, for, um, for integration or the incentives for, for really kind of um, concentrating monopoly power among providers, that weakens the network adequacy requirement. So in, in those cases, the carrier actually has more flexibility. And what I was actually hoping would happen more likely is a provider considering whether or not they would join a particular other group would say, well, wait a minute. If, neither, if we, we remain independent, we actually have some more negotiating leverage with insurance company because now the insurance company has to contract with one of us in the community. So that's, I mean, that's the idea we were trying to balance sort of that, that set of, of kind of forces. Yeah. There was a question, I think, before Scott, but um, uh, I'll start with Scott. Thanks. Scott Colby with the New Hampshire Medical Society. Um, thanks, Todd. It was a great presentation. Uh, I have one question and then I have a comment. The, uh, the question is how specifically, maybe I missed it, do you define community? Is community town? Is it service area? Yep. I'm thinking, I mean, the elephant in the right. room, I'm thinking Frisbee and Wentworth Douglas, and is Dover the community for Rochester? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I just, yeah. it's no, on I, I think that's. I think that's a, a fair question. I think that um, to the extent we're thinking about communities, we are talking primarily about town cities. The actual definition is, is, is still to be developed, and I think the Rochester-Dover situation is a good example. Personally, I feel people should access, have access to primary care and mental health care and some of the others within Rochester. Um, to the extent that means that they need to have a contract in place for all the other services, no, I don't think we want to go that far. Um, but that's still to be determined. We may actually decide in the end, yeah, if they're going to Dover, that's, that's within a close enough proximity, we're going to consider those two towns to be part of the same community. But that, kind, that situation is yet to be determined. But I think for, for something that's clear, like Manchester and Nashua, those are going to be two separate communities to the extent we think about access. And then my comment, is it possible to go back to the slide that showed, um, I don't know what you want to call them, not the core services, but the next tier out? We have to go into the next community right there. Yeah. The comment that I have is that it's in particular with the health, uh, with the marketplace, with the exchange products. When you have lower income individuals who um, maybe hourly or whatever, it's going to be a significant hardship on them to travel significant distances. And I know you're moving away from travel time as the measure, but things like rehabilitation are required two to three times a week for several weeks on end. And to the extent that they're out of the community, I'm afraid that could be an economic hardship on certain consumers. And so getting back to one of your last questions, does this protect consumers? Maybe not. So maybe you have to take a closer look at the moderate proximity services and bring those back into the core area to protect those people that have transportation barriers or just can't get time off from work. Yeah, I think that's, it, it's a fair comment. And it, it's one of those things that I think we're going to struggle with across the spectrum. I mean, the reality is that there are low-income people within communities where there's simply no access to some services and they're forced to travel. And it's, there had to be decisions at the, the provider level about what's going to be available within those communities and what makes economic sense for doing that. Um, so it's, it's, we're not going to solve kind of the issues related to poverty around network adequacy, but it is going to be based on that balance. Are there enough health care providers available locally that we could perhaps move rehabilitation or aspects, components of rehabilitation into a local level and it makes sense and consistent with the model? Um, and I, it's, it's, I think what's most important for us to understand today is the logic applied to how we're dividing up access to services and working out the details is something that is going to take a little bit more time. <laughs> I'm piggybacking on what Scott was just saying. I'm Evan Greenwald representing the New Hampshire Psychological Association. <coughs> Is there any thought process about certain services 
for certain regions being considered more poor services and in other regions being you know, considered more common services so that there can be flexibility by region, which I know would be really hard to write into general regulations, but it seems from a pragmatic perspective that would be reasonable. Using your analogy of you know National Manchester Concord, you know physical therapy that might be required to rehab services three times a week, it should be quite simple to find that, you know, within that immediate community. North Country, not so much. Yeah, the, I would say yes and no. The um, we absolutely want to recognize community differences. At the other end of the argument, we won't, don't want to be so prescriptive or so specific. We're dealing with today's situation that's going to be very different, I don't know, next year. So it's, um, so yes, I mean, we, the whole intention is to recognize differences in the communities, but also not be, be overly specific. And I think one of the, the challenges too is, is, geez, I mean, if we're thinking about all healthcare services, anything anybody could ever get, I mean, you can't develop or you, we shouldn't develop a set of rules that addresses anything anybody is ever potentially going to receive when it comes to health care, including the stuff that hasn't been developed yet. I mean, there's still just some practical limitations about what we can do. It seems to me that there may be some way to do that in a general manner while taking into consideration the different community supply and demand issues. You know, if there's a certain number of providers in a particular geographic region, then it becomes a core service. You know, if there's not, then it becomes a common or whatever service, you know, subject to sort of different wait times or travel time, whatever yeah. is the criteria. Right. Um, because obviously then that is taking into consideration the current provider, you know, population and presence and communities mm -hmm. and therefore assigning them to one category or another. Just, just something to Yeah, yeah no, no, I think that's fair. And one of the, one of the assumptions that um, uh, is that, that the providers in a community understand the needs of their communities better than potentially anybody else. So to the extent that you have a, a stronger concentration of primary care or mental health care types of providers in particular communities, that's probably because there's demand for those types of services. I mean, there may be certain parts of the state are simply more desirable to live, but on the other hand, we're going to respond to the fact that New Hampshire is laid out the way it is, perhaps for certain specific reasons. Um, and so to follow up on that, one of my questions in the behavioral health area is that there are multiple subspecialties within behavioral health, some of which, you know, there is a very clear reality around differences in supply and demand, you know, in my opinion, almost to a degree to which certain subspecialties, I believe, should be broken out and looked at separately or categorized separately. You know, the graph that you provided had sort of psychiatry as a broad spectrum, but, you know, there's a huge and dramatic supply and demand difference between child psychiatry and adult you know, psychiatry. So getting back to the core versus common, if you put child psychiatry in a core demand, you know, core, core demand area within a community, you might be putting undue constraint on insurance companies to provide that, you know, you know, driving the kind of thing that you're trying to avoid, which is increasing rates for child psychiatry, in, you know, in a particular community, because there might only be a few of them. Um, you know, and in other communities, all psychiatry might require an extended drive. So again, yeah. you know, with the sub, subspecialty areas, you, you also get into that. And at least for behavioral health, I know it's, um, you know, NHPA's sort of request to have different subspecialty areas considered differently simply because I think that would provide a more accurate um, access to care, uh, capacity for data collection and monitoring. And, things like that without unduly disadvantaging insurance companies. Right, right. Um, I was just reminding myself, I need to repeat the question people ask in terms of the acoustics. Um, to the extent we're, we're asking questions about very specific types of services and, and access to those services and ensuring those, those types of, of um, treatment for patients, I think it's, it's going to be, it is going to be challenging, but I think we're going to deliberately not try to get overly specific. We want the carriers to compete to the extent they're developing networks. One of the things I want to avoid giving the opportunity to carriers for is to choose sort of favorable selection among particular communities. So to the extent they develop their network in a certain way and they're likely to be more successful in certain communities with certain populations, that's the kind of thing we're going to have our, on our mind as we go into some of the details. But we don't want to be so specific that we essentially undermine competitive forces and insurance company autonomy in terms of how they develop networks. Um, there were a couple hands up over here. Evelyn? Uh, 
Not yet. Okay. We, dental is on the radar, but um, it's, it's, it's not incorporated at the moment. Yeah, and it's, I think dental has some of its own challenges, and even to the extent that we think about how dental services are provided by different types of dental providers and who's doing what and who's certified to do what, or lack of certification one or another, I think dental poses some unique challenges, but it is on our radar to, to include. Um, there was, um, I mean, there was one, uh, there, a couple of people have had their hands up, so give them a chance, yeah? Um, I'm sorry, you in the purple had a question? Yes, hi. Um, this is just a comment about um, the difference between the two categories within New Hampshire and New England and the, um, the, um, the category outside of, you know, within New England versus um, within New Hampshire and outside of the state. So um, I represent people with multiple sclerosis, and it's a complex um, chronic disabling disease, and so our model of care is more of a comprehensive care center. And so Dartmouth is in the process of meeting that requirement, and there's one facility in Concord. But we know that many people in New Hampshire do travel down to Boston um, because their um, case is so complex. Some are participating in research and clinical trials. So for example, would that just not be covered moving forward if, if they have been receiving care at a um, Boston hospital or participating in a cloud, uh, excuse me, Clinical trial or research would that be excluded from um, the network? So, so if I if I get your yeah. question right, you're talking about whether or not the network adequacy requirement or the benefit would be excluded in situations where patients are, are actually traveling to Boston but also receiving care locally. Yeah, you know, I think would be the specialty comprehensive care. Right, right. I, I think the answer is remember we're 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 not actually determining benefits. To the extent it makes obvious sense for an insurance company to let, continue to allow a person to access Dartmouth and travel to Boston, I don't think that's an issue we even need to deal with. When there's such a strong incentive for a carrier to do it anyway, then that's, that's probably not some place we need to go. The other thing to keep in mind is our network adequacy requirements are just a minimum standard, and it's, it's really a, a regulatory minimum standard. So I, I can't imagine that our, our standards would undermine that type of arrangement that's already in place. And if they do, then I think that's something I'd, I'd hope you'd bring our attention to. Okay, thank you. D. Daly, New Hampshire Physical Therapy Association. I am wondering, has there been any talk about anti-exclusivity <coughs> um, clauses so that one carrier couldn't lock up a provider of services to not be able to provide for multiple others? There are, not, not related to network adequacy, the state actually has other statutory prohibitions on, on arrangements that, are, that deal with contracting. We actually have a, a section of the insurance statute that, that deals specifically with, with contracting arrangements. Um, and follow up with me after if, if you want to know more about that. Um, Evan? One of the principles that I know that these regulations, as you identified, are looking to prevent is sort of provider monopoly, therefore driving costs up. And, and I understand that, especially in light of a lot of the hospital negotiations historically and things that have um, fallen into that category. I, I wanted to just, um, since I'm here on behalf of the New Hampshire Psychological Association, want to express concern in the behavioral health community that the reverse has sort of been the ethos um, in the sense that the majority of uh, psychologists, therapists in New Hampshire tend to be individual providers um, without any sort of large negotiating power whatsoever. And the, and the trend monopolistically is gone the other direction. So one of the criteria you are using to determine whether insurance companies have made a genuine effort at, you know, creating network adequacy um, by looking at whether they, you know, providers have been offered, you know, reasonable competitive rates. I'm not sure that, that criteria would necessarily apply as well to the behavioral health community as to primary care and other things or hospital-based care, since the behavioral health rates have been historically deflated fairly substantially by virtue of the fact that there has been no capacity for negotiating power. I, I think that's a fair statement, and that's one of the reasons that we feel as though the new network adequacy requirements are going to improve essentially the experience in a, in a carrier's network for consumers. To the extent it makes perfect sense for people to be able to get local access to certain services, I think that core requirement is going to improve the leverage that certain provider groups are going to have. And, that's, and I think that your mental health providers, as well as your primary care providers, are a part of that. 
I mean, these are just seen as, as services that it's very important. We feel it's very important for people to have uh, close access to. And the other issue, I think, relative to that, and this is part of why the community mental health centers, I think, have struggled and why larger systems have gone out of business in the behavioral health community over time, you know, and Northeast Psychiatric Associates in the 90s, you know, went away with Charter Brookside. Um, they couldn't sustain themselves. The behavioral health department of Hitchcock Clinic um, in Nashua largely went away in the 90s as well um, because the reimbursement rates were so low it couldn't uh, sustain larger you know, organizations. Um, and so there is sort of a different economic structure for large organizations versus the individual provider. It may, in fact, you know, be aided by this in some way. Um, but I just want to put out there that sort of standard rates as they've been offered as exists in New Hampshire may not necessarily be fairly competitive rates for behavioral health providers to sustain themselves economically. Message heard. Other comments or questions? Paul. Paul, I'm in the hand, hospital association. First of all, um, I think the basic concept is clear and I appreciate um, the way you kind of explained it. I did have a question about um, the common services and I don't think you, um, I, I thought it was, I thought you were addressing it by endo, endocrinology, but you're not, I was thinking it was endo uh, endoscopy, so it's really like the colonoscopies and those kinds of things that are pretty standardly provided within the community. So, but we can, we can provide you with written comments about maybe there are other services that might need to be more under core versus common, or just consideration, because you didn't, you didn't list those and that's something that's pretty routine. Yeah, no, that, I, that's very much welcomed, and, uh, and that is a good point. And it's, it's, it's one of those things, too, where to the extent we're imposing a requirement, a part of it is, is uh, the, part of the decision is, is this the kind of thing we need a requirement for, or is it so obviously such a good idea for the carrier to do that we don't need a requirement because it would be, you know, it would be, it's, it's, it would be an immensely bad idea not to uh, for a carrier. But yes, and that is a good segue to our next, pre, our next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, on community, to pick up on what Scott had asked, um, what we're used to in, in the, with the CON requirements is really health service you know, area versus a, when you talk about community, Manchester encompasses for those hospitals and those, those health services much more than Manchester, as does Nashua, for instance, many more communities. Every community has many more com smaller communities. So I just would um, caution to stay away from just particular towns and cities um, and make it more of a, um, when you talk community, to consider the, the outlying areas as well. Yeah, I, I think it would be. It, yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's something that obviously needs to be considered. We, um, but it certainly should be articulated to the extent we address it. Yep. Um, so I knew that I know we know this is a lot of new information today, and it's a very different approach. Um, for some of you that know me, that probably doesn't surprise you. But nevertheless, we um, are happy to receive comments. Um, well, and remember, this is the informal process, so this isn't your last chance to say anything. But if you can provide us any additional feedback by August 21st and send it to, to Danielle, and her email address is there. Um, and the only thing significant about August 21st is that's when we would expect it by. If you have information after that, we'll probably use it as well. Um, and depending on the feedback, we'll either host another discussion that still just talks about concepts, or we'll uh, start to draft the actual details and put them down in writing so that uh, uh, we can start to work through that process. All of this is going to take some time. Um, even to the extent we think about the cycle and the way insurance products are getting approved, uh, the network adequacy requirement probably won't impact any products that would, be, that would be sold before January 1st, 2016. So if you think about it, the insurance departments are reviewing the products now for, product, for, for exchange products that'll be for sale on January 1st, 2015. Um, it, it'll, be doing, be, it'll be the same thing next year at the same time. Um, I thought that the insurers had to get their stuff published by the end of Q1, early Q2. Get their, their networks published? Well, yeah. they're, 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 they're building their revenue models and stuff by the end of Q1. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. They're, how, how firm are those dates? Um, well, I'm, I'm 
nothing's that firm. I'm just thinking in the practical cycle, if it takes us six months for, for rulemaking. And yes, the carriers have to start making assumptions in, in the first quarter of the year, but they had to come far forward with a network that we would say is adequate or not when they submit their filings in, in May. And that's, it's, a, it's a big leap because they're talking about what's going to be the network in January 1st. And it's obviously been a challenge for the new carriers on the market because they're still building the networks and their network will probably be different on January 1st. But um, to the extent we're approving products, we have to look at their network. And, um, and then, of course, the network adequacy remains in place even on an ongoing basis. So if there's a failure to meet network adequacy, that goes back to what do we do to deal with that situation. So it's, I guess I'm just trying to give people a sense of, of when this is the earliest time this is actually going to play out. Um, but remember, network adequacy is ongoing. Um, and yes, I um, just mentioned it. Um, if you want to submit written comments and you can't read Tyler's email up there, Daniel's. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Daniel's email. Um, we're going to post this presentation on our website, and you'll also, um, if you registered and gave us your email, you'll be getting an email from Daniel shortly. So it, you'll have no trouble um, getting her email to give us your written comments. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. If you're not on the distribution list already, send Danielle an email and ask to be uh, included on that. Can I just make one, um, one more comment for thought um, for, for others, which is about the whole, um, I call it consequences, but whatever the action plan is if um, insurance companies may not meet network adequacy criteria. My experience is that a lot of the turmoil around this past year's Anthem product and the change in network adequacy, which I know has you know, prompted a lot of upheaval, you know, has, has been challenging both consumers, I'm sure, you know, for you folks as well. One of the things that I think might mitigate any of that in the, in the future is, um, as well as address genuine network inadequacy issues that may come up, you know, with insurance companies while giving insurance companies an opportunity to really do something different in the state and be effective to meet that is to have some sort of a, um, a, a plan review committee of some kind that would involve community members. And I, I know I've mentioned that to you. I want to sort of say it more publicly. I think that if people in the community were involved in the process when there is frustration or concern or insurers are not meeting um, network adequacy criteria, I think that people feeling like they had an input into change plans or being on a work group or an advisory committee that ultimately might collaborate with the Department of Insurance would give people more of a sense of input, if you will, that would actually sort of help manage some of the frustration and some of the issues that have come up. And I, and I wonder if New Hampshire is small enough, you know, there are a lot of different stakeholders. I wonder if that would not only help sort of the frustration process with that, but also literally affect meaningful change with insurance plans, acceptance by providers or stakeholders or whomever, and in the end of the day end up with what you're looking for, which is better service to consumers, a balance between meeting insurance companies' needs and demands and consumer needs and demands. First, let me make it clear, there's been no change in network adequacy standards. So I just want to make it clear. Um, and secondly, we're going to encourage as much public input as we possibly can get. We haven't even started the rulemaking process, like Tyler said. So this is the pre-pre-meeting, and we'll have some more times to sit down, and we'll have some more, we'll look for more input. Good suggestion to seek input from consumers. We view all of you <coughs> as consumers. We welcome your input. As a matter of fact, it can only get better with the input that you provide us as we go through our thought process. As you can tell, Tyler and the team have put a lot of thought into developing this. But this is only the beginning. Representative Schleich, can you come? Um, I'm trying to think about this from the consumer standpoint and just wondering what your expectations are after January of 2016 in terms of if I'm a consumer, am I going to see that I have choice of um, more affordable products? Um, will I have a choice of products that um, provide services in a way, and I know these are minimum standards, that I'm not spending hours 
arguing with my insurance company to try to get access to some level of care that right now I might spend hours on the phone trying to. Um, am I going to have access to, and I think this is the telemedicine thing, are you anticipating that for those of us who live in rural, rural areas, we will get the care in a timely fashion, but it may be done that way? Or um, going back to the question about um, um, access to studies or trials and stuff like that. Do you, from a consumer standpoint, see not only m lower cost price points, more competition in products for us, but also the issue of how much time consumers spend trying to negotiate care with their insurance companies? So the question is about what, how, does, how does the consumer actually feel uh, the impact of network adequacy in terms of, of costs and, and access in 2016? Representative Schlagman touched on a number of points and a number of challenges that I, I wish we could solve just through network adequacy. The reality is I think that there will be some improvements. I don't know what will happen to, to costs in 2016 because that's going to be dependent on a lot of different things that go into premiums. Um, we are very sensitive to the fact that, that as networks, uh, requirements for networks go up, um, there's usually a proportional cost and an impact on premiums. I like to remind people if we did away with network adequacy requirements, our premiums would go down. The problem is you may have to travel out of state for the most basic services and nobody wants to do that and often people when they buy insurance they don't know what they're getting and that's why we have a, a regulatory minimum that's in place. I do hope though that there will be better access for the types of care that people routinely need at a local level and will hopefully be able to provide some of the right incentives for the delivery system to respond intuitively and along current trends in terms of consumer expectations and that our network adequacy requirements would encourage that and not serve as a barrier. Could I add something? Yes, please. Um, the, the other issue that, that I, I think you touched on, um, Donna, was the access to information about what the networks are. And uh, we haven't mentioned much about that in this presentation, but the insurance department does intend to make it clear that the issuers have an obligation to provide easy access to information about which providers are in the network. And, uh, and we want that to be available at the time the consumer is doing the shopping. So. Now that we have more choice in the marketplace, now networks, broad networks, the key thing is to have easy access, for the consumer to have easy access to good information about who's in the network and who isn't. Um, and we do intend to, to pursue that and make sure that's available. Any other questions or comments? Great, well thanks again for coming. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.